This is a single stage of an IF amplifier using the OC45 transistor. Here is the circuit of the IF amplifier. It operates at 470 kilocycles and has a gain of 30 dB. As the circuit shows, the transistor is used in grounded emitter. The design of the transistor's DC conditions follows normal practice. The potentiometer formed by R1 and R2 fixes the DC voltage on the base of the transistor at say minus half a volt. Since the potential difference between the base and emitter is small, the voltage at the emitter is also minus half a volt, and if R3 is 500 ohms, the emitter current is fixed at 1 milliamp. C1 and C2 are HF bypass condensers, and C3 is the tuning condenser across the coil. Now, how do we design the AC conditions? First, we must know the transistor's characteristics. These are best expressed by means of an equivalent circuit. We could use the grounded base T circuit shown here. This circuit is an accurate version of the normal low frequency resistive circuit with extra elements added to represent the high frequency performance of the transistor. But for an IF amplifier, we would require to work in grounded emitter. So the grounded base circuit would be rearranged like this. This, however, is not yet in the most convenient form, and some further rearrangement can be made. If we take the section in the shaded square, we can replace it by a simpler network having for our purpose identical characteristics. We now arrive at the hybrid pi grounded emitter circuit. This circuit has a current generator acting directly across its output terminals. This generator is a function of the signal voltage between B dash and E. The value of the current generator is about 38 milliamps per volt when the transistor is operated with a DC emitter current of 1 milliamp. The transistor has internal feedback, mainly through the capacitance C B-C, which would have a similar effect on the amplifier as the grid anode capacitance of a triode valve, and a similar process of neutralization is applied. The effect of this feedback is that a voltage V produced at the output terminals by the current generator will produce an unwanted voltage at the input terminals across the source impedance. If we connect a phase changing transformer across the output and connect a suitable impedance back to the input, we can produce an antiphase voltage at the input to cancel exactly the original feedback voltage. Since we have neutralized the feedback, the output impedance is independent of the source impedance, and the input impedance is independent of the load impedance. So now we can treat our amplifier as a box. This box having a fixed input impedance, a fixed output impedance, and current generator acting across its output terminals having a fixed relation to the input voltage V. The value of the current generator will now change, since we must define it in terms of the true input voltage instead of the voltage across the points B dash E. Due to the voltage drop in R B B dash, the overall mutual conductance is reduced to 35 milliamps per volt. The next things we want to know are the input and output impedances. Bearing in mind that both the internal and external feedback paths are high impedances, we can take the input impedance simply as RBB dash plus ZB dash E, which, when simplified down to a simple RC combination, gives us an input resistance of about 650 ohms in parallel with a capacitance of about 1,000 picofarads. To obtain our output impedance, we must make one assumption. That is, that the phase-changing transformer we have added is a perfect lossless transformer. The losses of a practical transformer 
will be taken into account later. If we assume also that the losses in the feedback elements are small, the output impedance would be mainly RCE. But although we are neutralized to have no feedback voltage across the input terminals, a small feedback voltage can still exist across V-E. This has the effect of producing a current at the output in such a phase as to reduce the output impedance and increase the output capacitance. Taking these factors into account, we have a total output resistance of about 23,000 ohms and an output capacitance of about 30 picofarads. So far then, we have taken the conventional grounded base circuit here, converted it to a grounded emitter circuit, transformed this into a more convenient form, and applied neutralization. This has left us with a simple box having independent input and output impedances and the design of an IF amplifier is now straightforward. To obtain maximum power out of this box, we connect a matched load onto the output terminals. For maximum output power, the load resistance equals the source resistance. We must also tune out the output capacitance. To do this, we connect an inductance in parallel with it to resonate at our IF frequency of 470 kilocycles. For the time being, it will be convenient to imagine this inductance as having no losses, or in other words, it has a cure of infinity. Now, what's the gain? Taking the figures on the screen, the input power is V squared over R, or the input power is equal to V squared over 650. The output power is given by half the current generator flowing into the load, and since power is given by I squared R, the output power is equal to half 35V over 1000 all squared times 23,000. Taking the ratio of these powers, the gain is 36.5 dB. Now, what's the bandwidth? This is determined by the working Q of the circuit. And since Q equals ZD over omega L, it can be calculated. ZD is the dynamic impedance of the circuit, and in this case, since the coil is assumed to be perfect, ZD is 23,000 divided by 2, or 11,500 ohms. The bandwidth this gives will normally be far too wide for an IF amplifier. So we add an extra capacitance and reduce the inductance to tune once again to 470 kilocycles. The dynamic impedance the circuit at resonance has remained the same. And as omega L has reduced, Q has gone up there, so reducing the bandwidth to the desired amount. The only difference between this and a practical case is that normally we must take the losses of the coil into account. It can be shown, however, that even with a practical coil, the load resistance should always be made equal to the output resistance where maximum gain is required, and the desired coil and circuit cues are known. In the practical case, the inductance value is given by this formula, where omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency, L is the inductance, R out is the output resistance, 23,000 ohms in this case, Q naught is the Q of the coil alone, and QW is the operating Q of the total circuit. From this formula, if the coil has a Q of 100, and we need a working Q in the circuit of 50, 
then the inductance is 39 microhenries. And the total tuning capacitance is 3000 picofarads. We showed previously that the gain of the stage with a perfect coil was approximately 36 dB. The loss produced by a practical coil depends on its initial Q and is given by this formula. In our case, we make the coil Q twice the working Q, and this gives a loss of 6 dB making the overall amplifier gain 30 dB. To couple into the next stage, all we have to do is to add a secondary winding on the coil and arrange the transformer ratio to give the required loading of 23,000 ohms. You will see that the tuning capacitance is 3,000 picofarads. This is inconveniently high and can be reduced by increasing the coil inductance and replacing the tuning capacitance by a smaller one across the total coil. The total effective capacitance as seen from the collector is still 3000 picofarads. The neutralizing components which up till now we have assumed to be within the box can now be fitted in their practical place and their magnitude adjusted according to the turns ratio of the transformer. We have now completed the design and with the addition of the DC supplies have arrived at the complete circuit with which we started the film. One final comment. We limited our amplifier gain to 30 dB by allowing a coil loss of 6 dB. This gives two advantages. One, that our coils need have initial cues of only about 100. And secondly, that by not using the maximum gain of our amplifier, we can tolerate some error in neutralization, which together with close control of transistor parameters in production, allows us to fix the value of the neutralizing components and dispense with a variable neutralizing trimmer.